Main Street, how are we doing right now? Okay. Now, I know we tore us the tail end, but whatever energy you got left, we're going to need it. Uh, just to quick introduce myself quickly, my name is Vani Harari. This is Tammy and Dysart. We're the co-founders of an organization called Think 3D. Uh, we specialize in leadership development and organizational and community culture, which is a major theme to what you all have been talking about today. We've had an opportunity to pop in some different sessions and there's some really interesting and dynamic things that are happening here. You guys are talking about municipal infrastructure. You're talking about uh, uh, product lines and, and, and all of those different type of things. And, and they're terribly interesting and, and very, very important. But many of those things are tethered together by culture, by the things that connect us, the things that bind us. Um, ooh, I almost forgot. Before we get too far down the road, um, my friend Lindsay and I here were having a back and forth just a little while ago before we got on, and we were talking about brownies. I happen to be a person that believes that nuts should go into brownies. She doesn't. She has a problem with walnuts. I don't know what her issue is with walnuts. A quick show of hands if you like uh, nuts in your brownies. I think that's a clear majority. There's one dissenter up here, but we're going to disregard it's that. It's dark. You can't even see <laughs> No, no, absolutely. Well, when we get into this today, we're going to do a couple things. We're going to talk about some concepts. Obviously, you're smart enough to know that we're not going to solve it all in this short period of time, but we want to give you some ideas, some concepts, some things to think about, and we want to give you some opportunities to think through some of those things at your tables as well. So when we talk about culture, culture essentially, uh, long story short, is the art, artifacts, contributions, and collaborations that come from a particular group. And so in that way, we are all a part of a common culture, and, and of course, as a part of that, there are subcultures. And we want to talk about how valuable that is and how important that is, and some elements we want you to think about as we move through uh, the challenges that we're all working through. The first thing we want you to be thoughtful about, because a lot of you are here about this when we talk about recruitment and retention. That's one of the most pressing issues. This is something that we deal with quite a bit when people talk about recruitment and retention. And one of the things that we want people to think about is that for communities, it works similar to the way that it would work for companies. And the first thing that you should think about is that recruitment happens by way of retention. Recruitment happens by way of retention. See, if you think about where you're at in your job, a lot of times people don't necessarily put the same focus on you as they put on the people that they're trying to get because they already have you. But recruitment does happen by retention because you cannot hire who you want if you are busy hiring who you need. Your ability to be able to retain talent and create an environment that makes it so that people feel invested in, engaged with, and committed to that they would stay in that environment. Now, part of the reason why recruitment is so challenging is because most of the time we leave recruitment up to HR or to development folks. But see, recruitment is not a, and retention to that matter, they're not HR initiatives, they're not development initiatives, they're global initiatives, which means they involve everyone. Because if you think about your jobs or you think about your communities, a large portion of the reason why somebody wants to work at your organization or not is you. It doesn't matter who hires them. Who do they have to work by all, all the time? Who do they have to stand next to every day? And what's it like working next to you every day? What do you like to work with before you get your coffee? What do you like to work with when you're frustrated or disappointed or when you're sad or when something's happening at home? What is it like to be next to you every day? If people aren't being considerate about that, then they're likely not participating and retaining that person. The same is true of a community. In the town that you live in, what is it like to be your neighbor? What is it like to have to depend on you, to lean on you? How welcoming are you? Do you know the people who live in your neighborhood? And if you are in those small communities, if someone new came into your neighborhood, would you welcome them with open arms? Or would you keep them on the outside of your inside jokes and relationships? What is it like to be next to you? The other piece of it is, is recruitment. Where do the best employees come from? When you think about any organization, the best employees come from the best employees. It comes from recruitment. It comes from referral. So the question being is, is where are all your friends? 
Theoretically, birds of a feather flock together. So if you have talent, if you have skills, if you have work ethic, if you want to commit to your community and you want to do great things, the chances are that you probably hang out with a couple people who want to do the same. And the question is, where are those people? The same true of your community. Your friends don't just live in your community. How many people have you actively recruited to your community? How many people have you ingratiated yourself to, to let them know all the amazing things that your community has to offer and how much you need them? The best employees come from the best employees and the best neighbors will likely come from the best neighbors. Recruitment and retention aren't HR or development initiatives, they are global initiatives, meaning that they involve everyone. All of us have to be a participant. The other piece is we can't just get people here. Once we get people here, they gotta have a path, they gotta have a plan. One of the things that we always say when we talk about organizations is that people are like oak trees. The higher it is they feel like they can grow, the deeper it is they will set their roots. So whether it be in your employment or in your community, is there a plan for people? Is there a path for them? Is there a way for them to grow and develop? See, many people only focus on promotion, a new job or, or more money, but that's because that's the only thing they think they can get. But there's a lot of ways that people can grow and develop and promote themselves. They can grow and develop personally in their learnings, in their opportunities, in their relationships. What is the plan that you have? If a family comes to your community right now, what is the plan for them? If someone comes to your employer right now, what is the plan for them? What do you want for them? What do you want them to help their lives look like? How will you develop them? How will you grow them? How will you help them get experiences? If you don't have a plan for them, why in the world would they stay? People are exponentially more likely to stay if they feel like there's an actual plan or a path for them because they'll stay the course, presumably because it will take them somewhere. But people don't leave when they feel like things are bad. People, don't, uh, 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 people will still leave when they feel like things are good. When people start to look, when people start to get sketchy, is when things are stagnant. It's when they feel stuck. It's when they can't see a future or a light at the end of the tunnel. So if you have a path for people, they are much more likely to stay. The other piece is, how do you engage and empower your community? How do you put them to work? You see, the thing about it is, is that sometimes we leave all of the decisions to be made by the people in power and we leave everybody else to deal with the ramifications of those decisions. And sometimes we assume that people don't want to participate because they don't. But one of the things you will find out about people is, is that they would rather be used than be useless. They want something to do. They want to participate. They just want genuine participation. And this is especially important for your youth. How are people being asked to participate? What do they get to engage in? How are their ideas vetted? Are their ideas treated the same way as an elder's ideas? Or are they junior ideas from junior people who don't quite have the say? Who's driving this and where is the ownership? You see, a lot of people want buy-in. They want buy-in in their organizations or they want buy-in in their communities. But really, in many cases, what people actually want is buy it, meaning that they can present you with whatever you want and you're just supposed to buy it and go along. Buy-in communicates ownership, and ownership communicates responsibility, and responsibility communicates some level of control. And we all know that there's a lot of us who don't want to give that up. But if you want people to be a part of something, if you want people to truly invest and participate, there has to be real ownership, which means they have a real stake in the game. And that also means that we have to let go of the idea of passing the church, that someone else gets your community when you're done with it. Who would sign up for that? And so this is about how do we engage people right now, bring them to the table, and teach each other the skills of participation and engagement. So we're gonna take a little time to think about some of the things that you all could be doing to make these things happen in your communities and organizations. So we're gonna give you uh, on these topics a little bit of clear context of things that we see working in our communities and other communities across the country, and as well as invite you into the conversation. One thing that we know very clearly is that the best ideas don't just come from people who are on a stage, but the collective of all of us. In our short time here in North Dakota, I can speak for Vani and myself, we are 
just overly impressed about how many phenomenal things you guys happening, have happening in this great state of North Dakota, from the initiatives to being progressive to saying this is a real challenge that we have to start tackling as a collective. And so when you start to think about community strategy, how do we start to invite our communities into the process? Because for most individuals, when you think about culture, next to never have employees and people within communities had a real say-so, other than maybe voting in an election, or maybe, again, taking a random survey here and there that they don't get a whole lot of follow-up on. How do we genuinely get people to a space where they feel like they're, they're being heard, listened to, and invited into take part of the solution? So we saw this as an opportunity in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, where we reside about a year and a half ago, and we set out to start these quarterly community table talks. So what these are, uh, entailed was we had uh, invited our broader community into uh, a bigger space, about a couple hundred individuals. We had some very clear topics. We, we hold these sessions about quarterly, get some food going, get some networking going, get some collaboration. But we invite people in to have a say-so of how do we move our community forward around common issues. The whole theme of this uh, conference, again, there's common issues, small, medium, large, of our communities that we're all facing. And so how do we get people to participate in part of that solution? Part of the idea behind this is we have to get people beyond the idea of, I'm gonna drop off opinions and I'm gonna wait for city government or wait for my state or someone else to solve that, or even within organizations, that the responsibility of moving us forward to evolve our communi uh, communities and organizations in the 21st century has to be a global initiative, as Vani talked about earlier. Now, there's a, there's a part we have to overcome in that because, again, for most people, they've never truly been invited into that process, and so a lot of times they have that idea. But when you have these community table talks, what we challenge folks over these first few ones is show them great things that are happening. So, again, there's, there's clear and present progress happening, but then answer the question or, or say, Who's responsible for moving this forward? And, and the, the end answer to that is all of us are responsible. So when we think about that, part of what we have to sell to people and help them realize is what happens if we don't? What's really at stake? We had some really good conversations with several individuals here in the room uh, networking yesterday, and you can start to see us several communities around our country, not just in North Dakota, but around the country, the numbers are declining. They're seeing real issues because workforce, uh, all these community issues, how do we start to tackle these with a new mind's eye to that? So that's the part I wanna invite you guys into the participation of because science shows if we just sat up here for an hour and talked at you, at best you're gonna retain maybe 10% of this information. But the next level of how you retain information to take back into your homes, take back into your organizations and take back into your communities is when you get into group discussions because all of you have great ideas around these type of things as well. So what I'm gonna ask you to do for about four minutes, if you're at a table by yourself, I'm gonna ask you again to uh, put on your Midwest nice and engage with other folks uh, at other tables. If it were up to you, and if it was your responsibility one year from today to have clear and present progress about how we start to get more people involved, to see this beyond just the mayor's responsibility or maybe the Chamber of Commerce responsibility, what are one or two things that we could start to do to get clear and present progress to get the broader community engaged to say, this has to become our issue. We have to say, what can I do? Because out of the slew of things that are out there in the world, true, you cannot do everything, but how do we get people locked in to say, I can do something? So four minutes at your tables, have some conversations really quick. If it was up to you, what is something that you could do to help move this forward to get more people involved in saying, this is our issue to solve. How do we get more people engaged in these community issues to navigate forward into the 21st century? Four minutes at your tables, have some quick conversations, gather up if you're on a table by yourself, and go. Okay, let's bring it back in five, four, three, two, and one. Awesome. So hopefully you uh, have had some good conversations out there. Now, I'm going to ask that whatever that idea is, is that you take it and you hold yourself accountable to it. Let's put it into action. Let's make sure that we put it into practice so we can move that progress forward. But this is an example of just how we can start to have these type of conversations in our communities in a regular basis, particularly the smaller communities. It's much more manageable to have a large portion 
of your populace participate in these type of things so that we can all part participate in the ideation of what it takes. The next piece of it is, is communication, or excuse me, community. Now, community is the whole thing. That's the whole point. That's why we choose to live together is so that we can have community. It's based on the idea that we can do better together than we could do individually by ourselves. And for us, this one is really big for us. Our organization is fairly young, but when we started our organizations, one of the things that we said was is that we didn't want to quote unquote make it before we started giving back to our community. One of the things that we do in our community that we're really, really proud of is our Leaders of Tomorrow program. It's one of our leadership development programs where we have a 12-week program that we put folks through. We started out with emerging leaders, but now we have programs that we do for those emerging leaders, usually about 18 to 40. Um, we have ones that we do in multiple high schools within our community. We have leadership development programs that we do for our law enforcement, that we do for our teachers, and even for our justice-impacted individuals, our folks transitioning from incarceration generally within the first three years. This is something that we do passionately. Uh, Tammy and I are both habitual board members, probably more than what we should do, um, but we have to do our part. Now, all of the philanthropy that we do probably leads to about 13% of our revenue in terms of any type of compensation, but it makes up about 30% of our time, energy, and efforts. Now, some people will say, man, that is nuts. That is crazy that you would put that time and energy. What kind of business plan in that, is that? Well, what I will tell you is in the last five years, our business has quadrupled. And part of the reason is, is because doing good is good business. Not only is it good business because it gives you an opportunity to operate, oh, did I not click that? There we go. You want to see that. Um, not only did it give us an opportunity to work within our community, and connect with other people, whether it be on boards and things of that nature, where we got a chance to connect with other leaders and have an opportunity to see how they lead or see how they work. But also because we have a lot of beneficiaries to the things that we do. And those folks naturally uh, show appreciation. And they show appreciation not necessarily by giving us anything back, but going out into the community and participating. Is exampling some of the things that they saw us example and taking the skills that they have learned to go out into the community and demonstrate those things. And for us, what we call it is developing bench strength. By teaching these leadership skills, we're making people prepared to take the positions that we currently hold, probably too many. And some of you in here are likely doing too much in your communities. Not that you could ever do too much, but let's be honest, you probably are. If you've ever done a group project at school or if you've ever been aboard, you know that about 20% of the people do 80% of the work, and it's a lot. It's a heavy weight. And so what are you doing to prepare the people to help take those seats so you can put your energy where you feel it is most beneficial, in your strength zone? That's where we're trying to get people. That's what we're trying to do. How do you take your business and put it into the community to make your community more successful? Here's the other piece, is that part of the reason why businesses are so good at this is because the challenges that uh, communities have, whether it be with any type of subgroup, is organization, getting people together, getting people to agree, managing skills, knowing who can do what, who wants to do what. And so businesses are well suited to have disproportionate impact in their communities because you already have an organization. You already have systems, you already have processes, you already have skill sets and positions where people understand how to deploy those skills. And so you working within your community does so much more because of the fact that you can run it like a business. The other piece of it is, is that it gives you an opportunity to show young people, show people in other communities what it is that you can do. Because if you were gonna come to a community, don't you wanna be with the people who help build it? Don't you wanna be with the people who help take care of it? It's not just about attracting people to the job, it's about attracting people to the community. And if it's worth you investing in, then it might be worth me investing in. And for the folks who work in your organization, if you drive them, to know that if they build in their community, it will be better for your business. It's not something that you're doing for free. It's not something that you're doing just because you're nice. You get to do it because it's beneficial. Of course you wanna help your community, but it also can work too. One of the things that we have to work past is the idea that we can't get a return from doing good. We want more people to be motivated to do good. Doing good is good business. It'll benefit you and it's worth it. Now, the thing about it is, 
is that when you talk about the idea of community and you talk about the idea of connecting people, this one is pretty interesting. A lot of people end up making customers, particularly I'm speaking business right now. You want customers and clients, but you don't really want customers and clients. What you want is community. And this is the other part of that. This is why this is important. You do not want to create customers. You want to create community. Here's why. Um, have you ever gone on Amazon and looked at the reviews for something that you wanted to purchase? Have you ever been taken back by the absurdity of some of the reviews? One of the things I always like to keep an eye on is, is the tone of reviews. And sometimes I'll look at some of the negative reviews and I'll see things that people will say. And one of the popular things that I'll see is that somebody will give a, a product a really, really low score even though they say it works. They'll say something like, hey, I went online and I bought this toy for my kids and they didn't even play with it one time. One star. But you said that it works. But see, that's the thing about customers. Customers want what they want, when they want it, how they want it, for how much they want to pay for it. That's what customers want. You don't want customers, you, don't, you want community. You don't want people who are just gonna offer you criticisms, you want people who are gonna offer you feedback. Because customers don't want beta, they don't want trials, they don't want things that are in process, they don't want things that you're tinkering with. They want a finished product that works the way they want to work it, how they want, to, how they want it to work, for how much they want to pay for it. And you need people that understand you're developing things, you're experimenting, you're trying things, and not all of it's going to work. Not all of it's going to work now. Not all of it's going to work the way you want, and not all of it's going to come for how much you want to pay for it. That's not how the real world works. So if you keep making customers, you'll keep having to satiate something that is insatiable which is what the individual wants, as if you could possibly know. I don't care how many surveys you do, I don't care how many focus groups you do, you'll never be able to drill it down. My wife, God bless her, she'll come back from a restaurant and I'll say, how was it? She'll go, hmm, I didn't love it. And I'll say, what does that mean? Are you supposed to love everything that you eat? How is this person supposed to make it so that the 200 people in this restaurant all love it? It's impossible. It's something that's not going to happen. So one of the things that we have to do is create community. That means we're asking people to participate. We're asking people for their feedback and we're telling them we're trying something. We're going to make mistakes. It's not going to all land the way we want it to. And you can help us make it better by being thoughtful about how you offer us feedback. See, criticism is something that you give to people you don't know. You tweet criticism. Feedback is something, some, something that you give to people that you care about. Feedback is something that you give to people who are making something or developing something that you care about. And that's what we have to ask for our communities by creating that piece of it. We have to create communities in that way. Now, the next piece of this is what many of you are here for, you know, this thing called workforce that we talk about. And I want to challenge you on a couple things as we talk about workforce. So the first thing is, is that what we hear about people all the time is, is how do we get these people here? And most businesses, they think about money and packages and all of those other type of things. Let me give you a couple tips. One, if you are in someone's employ, you are underpaid. Shocking, right? <laughs> right? If you are in someone's employ, you are underpaid because people can't pay you to what you produce. Because if people paid you to what you produced, there would be no what? There'd be no profit. Right, that's not how it works, ladies and gentlemen. The system just doesn't work that way. In fact, all of you get up every day and come to a system to get enough money. You come to the system to get enough money, but what would you do if you had enough money? Lindsay, what would you do if you had enough money? I would retire. You would retire. I didn't even need to ask more than one person. See, all of you get up to go to a system to get enough money from a system that only works if you don't have enough money, because if you had enough money, you wouldn't come back. So the difference between what you want someone to do and what you pay them to do is made up in culture. Culture is currency. One of the things that we talk about, our, our, our biggest quote here at Think3D is that a culture will emerge whether intended or not. But if it's not one that you invest in, it will be one that you pay for. Culture is currency. That's what bridges the gap 
That's what makes people want to be there. So you have to think about the intrinsic things that connects people to a community. The other piece of it is, and this is the big one, because this is one of the biggest misconceptions in all of work, is that people work for you. Preposterous. People don't work for you. They work for their families. They work for their futures. They work for their lives. So one of the things that I'm going to challenge you all to do is stop telling people you're looking for workforce. What you're really looking for is life force. You need people to come to your communities and put some life in it, to help elevate it, to help make it better, to help take it to a place that it couldn't go without them. Why in the world would somebody want to pick up their family, come to a place just to work? And if you keep talking about people like they're commodities and not like they're a part of your community, not like you don't actually want them to live there, not like you don't actually want them for what they can offer you, for the different perspectives that they can bring to you, for the expansion of the worldview that you can have, and for all of the things that those people can bring to you that you did not have before they came. If that's not what you're talking about, why would I want to go there? It's interesting because when we talk about work, we talk about it genera generationally. And that was one of the big things that got us going. A lot of people talked about um, millennials. And they would say, oh, these crazy millennials, what do we do with them? And what we would always just say to people is that, first of all, these people are not pop people. They didn't come from Mars. They're your kids, first of all. Okay? So if you're mad at them, blame yourself. But secondly, the way they feel about work is informed. You see, if you had a parent come home too tired to play catch or help you with your homework, are you interested in doing what they were doing? If your father came home, plopped in a recliner, turned on a game, cracked open a beer, and maybe grunted at you a couple times in between innings, do you want to go to that place? When we sent this person to you, they were happy, healthy, and whole, and you sent them back a zombie. Why would I want to go do that? Work is not enough. In fact, work is the least of it, because what are you working for? So if all you have to offer people is work, they're not going to come unless they need the work. And do you want people who need it? No, you don't. You want the best. You want the brightest. And for that, you have to offer them a quality of life. Stop telling people they're a commodity. Stop telling them that they're just there to work. You want community members. You want neighbors. You want brothers and sisters in arms that are going to help you lift your community to where it could go. Part of this, yeah. I'm Give gonna... it up. Don't stop it. Let it, let it happen. <laughs> Part of our vision statement at Think 3D is to redefine the definition and expectation of workplace and community culture. We've been talking about this for, you know, culture has been this buzzword for the last decade plus, but especially on this side of COVID, we know that, again, the world is different. Again, that this next generation wants differently. I popped into the session earlier where we had, I think, about eight young folks uh, on the stage doing a panel about what they're looking for. They use words like culture. They use things like work-life balance. I want to be able to give back to my kids a lot of what Vani talked about because they saw their parents coming home too tired to engage with them and those are the people that they love the most. One of our sessions when we train with organizations is called success mindset. Success mindset. And what's interesting about this is we asked the question, how many people have a personal or custom definition of what success means to them? Chew on that for yourself for a second. How many of you in the room, just think about that, how many have your own personal or custom definition of what success means to you? When I ask that question, about 95% of people don't have their own personal or custom definition of what success is to them. So by implication of that, if you don't have your own personal or custom definition of what success is to you, will you ever be successful? And the clear answer is no. How can you? You can't hit a destination that's not defined. And make no mistake about it, this next generation sees that. In a world where, as Vani talked about, when we first launched Think 3D, part of the number one topic we talked about was millennials. And a lot of them didn't know necessarily what they wanted, but they were very clear on what they didn't want. They didn't want to go just work for a job for 30 to 40 years just because when that's not truly living. And especially in this day and age of social media where they have see people quote unquote living their best life, all those type of things, they realize their association with work has changed. One of the exercises we do with our clients, we have this uh, works piece of the pie. What it breaks it down to is the average working professional spends somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 75% of their waking hours at work, going to work, thinking about work, decompressing from work, et cetera. 
If you couple that with, and especially imagine yourself to be an 18 year old, if you start working at 18, work to the current retirement age of 67 and live to the national expectancy of 78, that's over 80% of our adult years working. Exciting, right? In that space, we asked this question at the end of one of our sessions. We asked, you know, asked, asked folks, show of hands, how many would go back? Not that you don't love them or don't respect them. How many would go back and live the same exact life their parents lived? I'm talking job, marriage, vacation, happiness, the whole nine. How many would go back and live the same life their parents did? At best, maybe about 3%. Then I ask a deeper question, a much more heart-hitting question. How many of you in the room here are currently living a life that your kids would sign up to live? And when I ask that question, that hits people in the heart, maybe 3%. What's interesting about this is we have clientele that are doctors, CEOs, manufacturers, it doesn't matter, we, we, we operate in almost every industry. And that 3% is about the same. So what it says is, it's not about what you do, it's much more about how you do it. In Sioux Falls, there's a gentleman that works at uh, Burger King, one of the most obnoxiously positive people at 6 a.m. that you could ever find, right? Just drive through in the morning, just good morning. And after a while, you realize, man, he's not faking. That is genuine. He genuinely loves what he does. And what I promise you is, if he had a little son, his son probably looks up to his dad and says, I want to work at Burger King when I grow up. And what this correlates back to workforce is, again, is we're redefining the definition and expectation of our workplace culture. It's not about what you do. It's not about more money. Because the interesting thing about that is, that financial deposit only gets put into your bank account every couple of weeks. Every single day, you take home more than a paycheck. A healthy culture versus a toxic culture is what you're taking home to your family. And so how are we evolving workplace culture in that space? And so here's what I wanna invite you to have some conversation around this, because when we talk about workforce and how we're redefining it within our organizations, how we're redefining it in our communities, part of this has to be how do we see, help that next generation see themselves what success could look like. Again, with this brain drain, as your kids are going off to college, how do you get them to come back to your communities and come back to want to participate? And if you're saying, wait your turn, especially as people are retiring later and later as our life expectancy grows, how do they see themselves in that pathway of what success looks like for them when most of us aren't exampling that? Because a huge part of success is happiness. Happiness is the point, and if they don't see us, it's not about sunshine and rainbows all the time, but if you like what you do, and more importantly, like who you do it with in a great community, that is a baseline to have a great life. And if they don't see that in the people that they live with and the people in their community that genuinely like what they do and, and come home with enough energy to still play with their kids and do those type of things, we're missing out. But I wanna broaden that just one more step as well. When we think about workforce in today's day and age with remote work and all those type of things, I heard the session yesterday and I loved the question. It was, what is your organization's or your community's unfair competitive advantage? Love that question. And I think being this the state over, I think here in the Midwest, especially the Dakotas, I think one opportunity we have is we can sell something different to a lot of the country. Von and I, we do speaks all across the country, we have client bases all over the, over the nation. And I can tell you there's a lot of people that are fed up with the two hour commutes and the traffic and all those type of things but that's all they know. If we could evolve to help people say, hey, San Francisco resident, you could have a phenomenal life here in small town North Dakota, small town Dakotas, whatever it is, a great life. If you could work remote and make uh, San Francisco wages and live in this great community where people are actually say hi to each other and genuinely care about each other, there is a great marketing opportunity that we all have to say, how do we pitch that to not just show the next generation what success could look like here in our community, why we want them to come back, not just to live here, but to participate in the process, but also there's a broader audience. This, this isn't just fighting for workforce within 100, 1,000 people, a few thousand people. We have to start looking at this thing from a nationwide perspective. How are we recruiting people from these communities that just have no idea there is a phenomenal quality of life that they could have right here in North Dakota? So, Back in your same groups, let's take four minutes. If it was up to you one year from today, how would you better involve this next generation to see themselves, how they could have success long-term and participate in how we're evolving our community and organizational culture for both of us, not just waiting for them to hand over to them and or 
how you could broadcast it and market that out to other communities to say this is a place where you can have a great life because we are just a phenomenal place to live, great people, and great opportunities. So four minutes, how would you take the next right steps to move that forward in your community or organization over the next 365 days? Four minutes, have some conversations, and go. Okay, let's bring it back in five, four, three, two, and one. Good stuff. Now, this is my favorite topic to talk about of all the things that we talk about, and that is you. You know, whenever we talk about a community, whether it be our, uh, um, our larger community or whether it be our work community, and sometimes even in our family community, we get so caught up in the we that we lose the I. And one of the things that sometimes people forget that is truly effective in changing and evolving a, com a, a culture is dealing with the individual, the person. One of the things that we deeply believe in is that a better you is better for everyone. And that spending time to deal with yourselves, spending time to develop and grow and love and take care of yourselves is the key to community. The reason why that is, is because where most negative emotions stem from, where the scarcity mindset, which is the death knell of small communities in particular, but communities and cultures as a whole, come from insecurity. Insecurity is where all of those negative emotions come from. Because it makes it hard to focus on other people when you focus on yourself. Let me give you an example. So if you have a gas stove at home, and you're not sure if you turned it off, no matter how good what I'm saying is to you, what are you going to be focused on? The gas stove. I mean, it could be off, but you're not sure it's off. That's how insecurity works. When you're unsure about your place in things, when you're unsure about your resources, when you're unsure about what you have, it makes it near impossible to focus on anything outside of yourself because it is all consuming. And when a person is insecure within their community, it makes it hard for them to be thoughtful about the community because they are so concerned with themselves. Now, that's different than taking care of yourself. And so we want to move people past insecurity. We want to move people into confidence. We want to move people into health. And for that, that means taking care of yourself. For that, that means taking self-care. And sometimes I get frustrated by the way that we think about self-care because it almost makes it seem like self-care is selfish. But if you have kids, if you have people who depend on you, you realize that it is not selfish. And that you taking care of you is the only thing that's keeping those people alive. I'm joking. That was aggressive. I don't, I don't mean it that deep. But it does affect other people. And so being able to take care of ourselves is something that we have to promote and we have to be prominent. Because here's the thing. When we talk about community, if the whole of it, it is not good, the, the individual parts of it are likely not going to be good, right? Um, for instance, if we have a pie and it doesn't taste good, will it taste better when you slice it? No. If the whole of it's not great, and that's why culture is so important. But when individuals have to do the work, when they have to come and bring their best selves, it means you have to take care of yourself. It means that for all of you folks in here who are likely the martyrs of your community, you got to take a couple days off. And every once in a while, you got to let some stuff break because you can't fix it all. You can't build it all, you can't hold it all, you can't keep it all, you can't do all of those things and have it work. You have to trust other people, you have to develop other people, you have to put faith in other people, and that's very hard to do when you are not locked in to yourself. Like I tell people this all the time, I do everything for me. I do everything to make me happy. Everything that I do is to make me happy because happiness is the point. But here's what I found out. I'm most happy when my wife's happy. I'm most happy when my business partner is happy. I'm happy when my team is happy. I'm happy when my community is happy. When those things are out of flux, it makes it hard for me to be happy. And see, here's the thing. When you work hard at being happy, you'll be happy to work hard. This balance is nuanced. 
And sometimes when you're trying to do these big lifts and you're trying to make these big changes and you're trying to shift communities and change futures and things of that nature, it's so easy to lose yourself in it. But you cannot lose yourself in it. You have to be an example for people of the best ways to take care of yourself, develop confidence, and have the type of security that allows you to be available to other people. And that brings us to the most simple definition of leadership there is. Leaders go first. Leaders don't wait. Leaders are the first ones to apologize. Leaders are the first ones to be the bigger person. They're the first ones to take that step. They're the first ones to start that experiment. They're the first ones to risk it. Leaders go first. And so many of you are coming from organizations and communities where people are stuck in the way that we've always done it. And remember, if you're still doing it the way you've always done it, it means you've never done it better. So stop that. But you go back to these places and you're dealing with people who have doubt and insecurities and fears. And they don't want to lose this community that they've been building. They don't want to lose their place in it. They don't want to lose their value. And the only way that you're going to be able to get them off of that is to make them secure, is to get them to a place where they're taking care of themselves, loving themselves, developing the confidence that lets them know that they're okay. And the only way that they're going to do that is if you do that. Leaders go first. You have to be the example. You have to drive the culture. It's not enough that you just come with the good ideas and things of that nature. You have to example what it takes to take care of yourself. So on this last one, if we can be honest about where we're at, in not just North Dakota, South Dakota, but in our country, I do truly believe that America is the greatest country on this planet. But we have to look ourselves in the mirror and be very honest. All the studies show, especially on this side of COVID, and this is just the self-reported numbers, one out of four adults, so just do the math in this room, dozens of us in this room, one out of four adults in this country are going through some level of depression or anxiety. This is a pandemic that is still ongoing. Had a really good conversation with a gentleman last night that again, most of the, the implications of this isn't going to start showing up for the next three to five years. So this is just a folks who have self-reported, these are the major issues at hand. And oftentimes, especially a lot of you who would take time off work, come to a conference like this, there's a passion, there's a desire to make our lives, our communities better. And, and as most of us know, it usually falls on the shoulders, unfairly, of a few. Everyone has these issues, but again, everyone in a world of busy, busy, busy. What's interesting about that is, COVID showed us that we didn't have to be as busy as we were. And as soon as the world kind of opened back up, we jumped right back into whatever this normal is. Even in the simplicity of how we talk about this in everyday language, when you ask most people, how is life? What's the number one common response? Busy. Have you ever heard someone say that in a positive light? How you doing? Oh man, I'm busy. It's amazing. <laughs> no, it may not mean it's like death nail negative, but it's a slight negative. I'm, oh, it's usually with a, a exhale, X, Y, Z. Language matters. And so for Bonnie and I, if you look at, he actually made a comment earlier. He said, man, my, cal my calendar looks like Tetris, <laughs> trying to fit things in there. But we don't use that terminology busy. We are thriving. Because if I allowed these meetings, if I allowed these things back on my schedule, it is by choice. And that's where we have to start to take back control, back to a better you is better for everybody. Because who are you really serving? Who are we really serving in our lives if most of us are operating as the best version of a lesser us? where we are addicted in our country to good enough, simply because it's better than, so on and so forth. And, and a part of that is, we have to start to define what is our whelmed. We often hear, man, I'm overwhelmed, right? But a lot of that is because we have not clearly defined what is your whelmed. Every one of you in this room, including myself, you have a tipping point. But if you don't take time to be honest with your 168 hours, be clear, there is a never ending amount of good things that, that is gonna ask for your attention that you could do. And it's hard, especially when you're tethered to the impact. But again, asking yourself, if you're being less than as a spouse or less than as a parent or less than and all these different things, if you're diluting your energy, we are not serving the people around us. So everyone who was, who's ever traveled on an airplane, you've heard it, if turbulence happens and life is gonna happen, it's gonna have its turbulence, what do they tell you to do when the mass drop from the sky? Put your mask on first. Why? Because you are no good to anybody if you're passed out. And if we're being honest, looking around us, how many people are walking around as shells of themselves? They are rarely, if ever, 
getting to their optimal version of who they're capable of becoming. And so again, who are we really serving in that space of not being our best selves? And so if we don't start to define what whelm is for us, understanding what our capacity really looks like, it's easy to become overwhelmed. And Bonnie touched on that earlier. I think one of the biggest deficits we have in our country right now is a, is a, is a gap in self-confidence. How do you build your confidence? What does it take to truly be confident in what you do and the impact that you're having? It's putting the work in. One of my favorite basketball players was Kobe Bryant. And he was confident when he stepped on the basketball court because he put the work in. And many of you, again, I'm sure you're putting the work in, in those type of things, but how do we start to get other people to see I too can participate in this thing? And ultimately, when we talk about this personal development, and this is a challenge, I think, most, more so to organizations. When you think about this idea of personal development, most organizations have historically seen it as it's a personal responsibility. Well, let's look at the data. Left to people's own devices, literally, in today's day and age, most people, especially as this next generation, what are they doing with their spare time? On their devices, Netflix, those type of things. Studies suggest three and a half hours a day. Three and a half hours a day. Globally, globally, escapism is said to be a four trillion, with the T, four trillion dollar a year industry. What is the number one thing people are escaping from? Work, when it takes up 50 to 75% of your waking hours. And so if we don't start to redefine the definition around this, if you're not giving people space and encouragement and reward to become better versions of them, we are lose, leaving opportunities on the table because our argument to that is, in traditional leadership development, it was always hidden under the guise of making you a better employee for the sake of the business. And there is nothing wrong with that. You should want a return on that investment. You're giving time, energy, and effort to your employees to do so. But that doesn't necessarily make them a better human being. When the reality is if you help make them a better human being for the sake of themselves and their families, they will always come back better teammates and better coworkers and better people to work with. And so as you start to think about this idea of a better you is better for everybody, we have to start to take away this stigma around mental health, how we're dealing with it. I heard, uh, I met a gentleman last night, his name was Jonathan, um, around this idea of mental, or not mental health, addiction in, the, in, in North Dakota. You guys are doing some amazing work. I think there's a big conference next week. I applaud you guys at the highest level. And I love that the goal of that was to reduce the stigma around addiction. But the same thing has to happen around mental health and all these the realities of what we're facing. And so I would leave you with this challenge. As you think about this idea of leading first, leaders go first, over this next year, we don't have time just for, as we're about to land the plane for the day. Over this next year, one year from today, how would you show up as the next better version of yourself? Because if you truly love the people that you engage with, if you love your family, those type of things, we have to start putting ourselves first to lead and say, my best self, team me that 100% is a better husband, is a better community leader, all those type of things. And we historically, especially in this part of the country, have just gave and gave and gave. And so I'll leave you with this. Uh, again, I'd love to connect with you guys um, on this space. But one of my mantras that I have, or we have at Think 3D, is you teach through the clarity of your example. And so as we think about workforce, as we think about community, and as we know, there is no blueprint to this. There is no two communities that are exactly the same, even if they're the same population, there's different demographics, there's different backgrounds. If we have a good idea, how do we lead first and show the power of possibility in that? And as we do so, as we become better versions of ourselves, we will make for a better workforce, and a better workforce makes for a better community. Again, I applaud you guys to the highest level for all the work that you're doing here in this great state of North Dakota. Thank you so much for having us. We look forward to engaging with you guys in the future. Thank you. Hunters from Think 3D. For all of you that are here, we do have some uh, our award ceremony that is going to be rounding out today's event. So what I'd like is all of our EDA award winners, if they can meet us at this door at the back of the hall, we'd like to go ahead and gather them now. And then as we are preparing the award ceremony part of today's event, I have everybody else here. I'll give you a 10-minute break, and then we'll come back here with our closing remarks from our governor and our award winners. So we'll see you back here in 10 minutes. I'm not telling you.